Welcome everyone. Um, we are blessed to have Mario here with us tonight to um, talk to us on a pilgrimage to Constantinople. Thanks, Gia. Thank you to Father Thanasi for um, inviting me along with uh, you, uh, Dora, sorry, and your sister Gia for inviting me to give this talk uh, tonight. Oh, it's late. It's late and I'm confusing names. I'm sorry. Um, a pilgrimage to Constantinople. So Constantinople is, of course, a very tangible and immediate reality for us here in Australia who are members of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Australia because our church here is an eparchy of the Ecumenical Patriarchate. It falls in a broad sense under the jurisdiction of the Ecumenical Patriarchate, which is in Constantinople, today known as Istanbul in Turkish. And... Um, the Holy Orthodox Church of Christ um, has passed through the civilization um, known as Byzantium in Western scholarly milieus. That's the very ancient name for Constantinople. So I'm going to be throwing a lot of um, uh, names and terms at you today, and I'll do my best to clarify them. Um, the church has passed through this civilization in its historical tra uh, trajectory and taken on aspects of its culture, its aesthetics, and has delivered them to us today in our immediate experience in the Orthodox Church, whether we're speaking about iconography, or we're speaking about Byzantine chant, or architecture, and so on and so forth. So there are many ways in which Constantinople um, is immediately relevant for us. For those who don't know what the Ecumenical Patriarchate is, the Ecumenical Patriarch is the first among equals in Orthodoxy. So um the leader of the orthodox church but not understood in the same way as the pope is for the roman catholic church he's the first among equals and um he's there in constantinople now called istanbul um i wanted also to showcase to you tonight uh some of the research that i've been undertaking recently um on a book on constantinople uh which is tentatively entitled remnants of new rome another word, another designation of constantinople so we've heard byzantium we've heard constantinople we've heard istanbul which is its modern name in turkish yet greeks tenaciously still refer to it as constantinople and we've heard new rome as well it's all referring to the same city um so remnants of new rome uh, reflections on the sacred topography of constantinople and that will be published um by saint andrew's orthodox press God willing, this year, His Eminence Archbishop Makarios of Australia gave the blessing for it to be published. And it's a photographic sort of a book which describes uh, photos of landmarks and churches, uh, some of which have since been converted in, into mosques, and some of which were museums and are now mosques again, um, that I took photos of about a decade ago when I was in the city. So um, uh, that's more of a, let's say, focused uh, analysis with analysis of the art and architecture mostly of the city but I kind of draw into it um, uh, the lives of saints associated with the city and events that took place in and around Constantinople that are relevant to the life of the church even up until today so it's a very kind of a broad broad book in terms of its uh, scope but it's focused insofar as it is on Constantinople and persons and events associated with the city. Um, earlier this year, I published this book um, from the ancient Near East to Christian uh, Byzantium uh, with Cambridge Scholars Publishing. And that places Constantinople within a broader sort of um, chronological framework of the history of civilization. So I kind of, with this book, I tried to locate Constantinople as a high point of civilization. Um, undertaking an analysis beginning with the very first cities in history, leading up to the founding of Constantinople by St. Constantine the Great, and with my, my recent book, which is coming out, God willing, soon, it's just on Constantinople itself. Um, so that's a bit of a background to what I'll be discussing tonight. Let's get straight to some of the, the images uh, that I want to show you. Now, with, um, with the slides that I'm about to show you, I've included some photographs that I took uh, myself when I was in Constantinople or Istanbul uh, in 2011. Um, some photos that I took uh, in Italy uh, as well in, in 2011 and 2016. 
Uh, the book includes uh, many more photos and um, uh, I had to undertake an analysis of some churches in Italy because uh, there were some regions in Italy which fell under the, uh, the ages and the administration of Constantinople and you have to go there of all places to find out what Byzantine Orthodox Christian churches looked like in the 5th century, in the 6th century, because they no longer exist in Constantinople. They've either been demolished or converted into mosques or something else, right? So um, my book also contains um, reflections on churches in Italy and also Mistra in the Peloponnese, which um, is one of the last places where Byzantine art and architecture flourished as well before the fall of this civilization, the fall of Constantinople to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. Um, so this map that I've got here is perhaps the best place to tell, uh, to begin telling our story. Uh, it's a map uh, depicting the promontory, which is um, a body of land surrounded by three sides of water. You see to the north, the Golden Horn, um, to, the, to the east, the Bosphorus, and to the south, the Sea of Marmara. When in the fourth century AD, St. Constantine the Great was warring against his rival pagan emperor Licinius and chasing him across the eastern uh, territories of the Roman Empire, in, in, including Greece, uh, Thrace, and Asia Minor, he spotted this piece of land. The city that was on this piece of land was known as Byzantium. Byzantium, we say uh, in a Latinized way. And um, because of the political turmoil affecting the Roman Empire at the time, instability on account of the fact that barbarian tribes coming from Scandinavia and Germany were destabilizing uh, Western Europe, places like Italy and Gaul, modern day France and, and Spain, um, he had been considering moving the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome itself, which is in Italy, to a new location. And he decided that this location, which is in Thrace, in northeastern um, Greece, uh, and no longer part of Greece uh, these days, of course, it's in Turkey, um, would be ideal because all he had to do was throw up land walls on its western side, which you can see there, the walls of Theodosius II, the walls of Constantine were the initial walls, and when the city grew in the next years, the war with Theodosius II went up, um, uh, it would be easily defensible. And so he decided that this would be the new capital of the Roman Empire. St. Constantine the Great is also distinguished for being the first Roman emperor to convert to Christianity after the Roman Empire had persecuted Christians for a few centuries. And so he had begun a Christianization process of the Roman Empire. He began to, be, uh, to build churches in and around the city of Rome in the Holy Land. Uh, the first um, church is dedicated to the, um, the resurrection of Christ, the Holy Sepulchre, which is built over the place where our Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and rose from the dead, uh, the Church of the Nativity. Um, these were all built by St. Constantine. And so as we're getting closer towards the year 325, which is when he began construction on this city, um, it would be inevitable that the city would be filled eventually with a lot of Christian churches. And he would Christianize gradually uh, this space. It would be something, this Christianization process would be something that was continued by subsequent emperors because Constantine is still a transitionary figure kind of straddling um, the interstices between the older uh, pagan conventions of the Roman Empire, belief in many gods and all that sort of thing, and the new belief that our Lord Jesus Christ has disclosed the truth concerning who God is as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within the church. So, the powers of the Palestinians, we spoke about uh, St. Constantine the Great, and he began construction on the city um, in 325 AD. Uh, construction was completed in five years by 330 AD. And the city was um, founded officially uh, in celebrations that were undertaken on the 11th of May, 330 AD, during the feast day of St. Mokios. St. Mokios was um, a martyr who uh, was from Byzantium, the former city, before Constantine 
renamed it after himself, Constantinople. Um, and uh, it was on the feast day of St. Mokios, a martyr of Byzantium, that uh, Constantine founded the city officially with celebrations and all these sorts of things. Here you see remnants of a colossal statue of Constantine, um, which can be seen in uh, Rome in uh, the uh, Capitoline Museums. Uh, this was in Rome itself. It's in pieces now. Um, and it was placed in the Basilica Maxentius, which is in the heart of the old imperial capital. Um, in the first uh, chapter of my recent book, I begin with the Forum of Constantine, because according to the ancient Byzantine historians like Philostorgius and others, this is the place where construction on the city began. His Forum, which was an oval-shaped kind of open area that had a column in its center. Um, Philostorgius actually says that as Constantine was marking out the perimeters of the city, um, he was uh, taking his retinue along the uh, what would be the Constantinian walls on its western side there. And uh, he kept walking and walking. And one who had the courage to speak to him privately went up and said to him, how much farther, Lord? And he said, until the one who is in front of me stops. And apparently there was an angel guiding the way for him to mark out the perimeter of his city. But after he marked out the perimeter of his city, he began construction here at Constantine's Forum, this oval-shaped um, structure. And a forum is like the ancient Greek agora. It's a public meeting place, a place where people would come to uh, buy and sell goods, where they would hear uh, senators and other public officials uh, speak to the population and so on and so forth. And at this juncture, he erected a statue of himself at the top of this particular column, um, which is still there in Istanbul. You can go and see it. Uh, a statue of himself as the sun god Apollo. And you'll think to yourself, what is St. Constantine doing erecting a statue of himself on top of a column as the sun god Apollo? At the base of the column, he places relics from the Christian church. He places bread that Christ multiplied when he fed the multitudes and so on and so forth. This combination of imagery, both pagan and Christian, might seem shocking to us. But in fact, city building and city founding since very, very ancient times was associated with what's known as the ruler cult, the worship of the emperor as the god. And even though Constantine did not demand that he himself was worshipped as a god, nevertheless, he could not necessarily escape putting this kind of imagery into his city. And it's one of the very few examples of, let's say, um, imperial cult imagery that Constantine put in, in the city. Um, the main examples of ecclesiastical architecture that he incorporated in his new city include the Church of Hagia Sophia, the very first Church of Hagia Sophia, um, named after Holy Wisdom, it means Holy Wisdom, and it's dedicated not to a Saint Sophia, but to Christ as God's very own Sophia, as God's very own Wisdom. And he also um, built the first Church of the Holy Apostles, um, which uh, would become the Imperial Mausoleum, where all subsequent emperors and empresses would be buried. Now, None of the Constantinian structures or edifices in Constantinople remain. And that's not because the Turks had conquered the city in 1453. In the sixth century, a couple of hundred years after Constantine's reign, St. Justinian the Great, who built 33 churches in the city, um, he built over all of Constantine's uh, buildings. And he erected the Hagia Sophia that we see today in Istanbul. Okay, he erected that Hagia Sophia. But there was another Hagia Sophia in between those two. So in fact, there were three Hagia Sophias all up in Constantinople. Constantine's Hagia Sophia, that burnt down in a fire uh, in 403 AD when St. John Chrysostom was exiled from Constantinople. It was rebuilt um, by uh, Theod uh, Theodosius II. But that Hagia Sophia um, was destroyed in the 500s during the so-called Nika riots in Constantinople when um, the populace rose up against the Emperor Justinian and his wife Theodora. And actually, after the Nika riots were suppressed, Justinian was able to rebuild a lot of the city 
um, in a monumental way, in a way that influenced it for centuries to come. That also influenced um, the church's uh, liturgical cycle and its calendar, because some of the churches that he erected, uh, we celebrate as feast days in the church and so on and so forth. So all of this is very relevant for us today. It's a long arm of hi history reaching out from 1500 years ago to our contemporary services in church, you know, so just uh, want to highlight that, uh, that it's immediately significant. Um, and I'll be doing a bit of that tonight. I mean, another structure that was very significant that Co Constantine incorporated into the city is the so-called million. Um, Hagia Sophia is to the right or to the um, east of this picture. Uh, there's a brick chimney there, and the million is just here, and you can see a close-up of it here. That used to be a tetrapylon, four legs with an arched or vaulted roof. It used to be an enormous kind of structure. And it marked the distances to all of the cities in the empire, designating Constantinople as the new center of the world. The Milion was actually based upon the Miliarium Aureum, which was um, erected by the Roman Emperor Augustus in the first century BC in the Roman Forum in the Old Rome. Remember, Constantinople's the new Rome. And in the old Rome, Augustus, the first uh, Roman emperor, erected a vertical um, bronze encased pylon, which marked out the distances to all the cities in the empire. Here, Constantine, because he shifted the capital from the old Rome to the new, is doing something similar. But the very top of his tetrapylon, four legs, four columns, tetrapylon, that's what it means, and uh, arched kind of roof, he had a statue of the cross with himself and his mother on his. And that is the basis for our contemporary Orthodox depiction of Saints Constantine and Helen. Because as we know, Saint Helen, the mother of Saint Constantine the Great, underwent a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And she was the one who, in fact, discovered the locations of Christ's burial and resurrection, the place where he was born in Bethlehem, and so on and so forth. And she even discovered the true cross. So the statue that was upon the million depicts Constantine and Helen on either side of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that Helen found, right? But it does something even more striking than that. Because the cross is on top of the measurements to all the cities in the empire, it designates the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ as the center of the world. We've covered very briefly a handful of things I discuss in my book in relation to the Constantinian structures in Constantinople. There are many more, but if we're going to do this kind of snapshots or vignettes from um, the respective epochs that I cover in the book, then we have to move on. So, um, so much for Constantine's reign. Let's move um, on to the reign of the emperor uh, Theodosius. Now, like any city, Constantinople needed its public entertainment, its equivalent of a football stadium. Yeah? We go back even further into the ancient Roman past, we have what is known as the Colosseum or the Amphitheater of Flavium. And that uh, was a place that was notorious for its gladiatorial fights. Constantinople would not reduplicate something like that. This was a more civilized time. The Hippodrome was, was its equivalent of the Colosseum, the Hippodrome. In fact, it was modeled upon the ancient Roman Circus Maximus. It was basically a race circuit, a race circuit in the form of a, of a rectangle, which is curved on, on its four corners. And that was very close to the Imperial Palace down So we see Constantine's Forum here, where he began construction on his city. And uh, we have the uh, column marked by that pinprick there in the center of the, the Forum. We have the Milion here, which marked the distances to all of the cities in the empire, which was adorned with a cross on the top. And here we have the circus right next door, the Hippodrome. Why um, was it called uh, uh, the Hippodrome? Because it was a racetrack for horses, hippos uh, in Greek, horses. And so the Hippodrome in its central spine, so in the middle of the track, central spine, actually had monuments 
that designated Constantinople's superiority to all former civilizations. That obelisk that you see there, and that you can still see if you go to uh, Sultan Ahmed Maidani, which is what it's called, Sultan Ahmed Square is the name of it now, uh, is 4,000 years old. It was transferred from Karnak in Egypt by the Roman Emperor Theodosius I, who uh, ruled maybe 50 years after Constantine, 40 odd years after St. Constantine had passed away, St. Theodosius I. He moved it here to demonstrate the superiority of Constantinople over all previous empires. St. Constantine I convoked the first ecumenical council of the church that designated that Christ is truly God, fully God, or Mausio Stopatria, one essence of the Father, something which the church had always experienced, but articulated this central tenet of the Christian faith. Theodosius I, who constructed the Hippodrome, he convoked the second ecumenical council, which reaffirmed the doctrine of the first ecumenical council that Christ is fully God. So when you go to a place like the Hippodrome, you're coming into contact with a structure made by an emperor who convoked the council of the church, um, whose doctrinal definitions, the doctrinal definition of this council is still not only binding for us Christians today, but that's where our creed that we read at every Sunday liturgy, you know, was finally put together. So uh, there are tangible reasons why it's good to know this history. You know, it's not just a matter of a curiosity about the, uh, the distant uh, past. And if you look at the base, the pediment of um, the obelisk that was moved from Egypt to, to Constantinople, you see a base relief depicting the Emperor Theodosius and his family with his entourage on either side um, in what was the kathisma of the Hippodrome, the main imperial box. So what would happen, if you look at the group here, which is next to the Hippodrome, we're not going to look at it now, but the Kathisma is here, right? So basically the emperor could go straight from the great palace to the Kathisma of the Hippodrome and watch the races. He would kind of manifest there in front of the people. The Hippodrome could hold up to 60,000 people. All that remains is a single seat of the Hippodrome. All of the seats have gone. They were reused in subsequent centuries after the fall of the city in 1453. Um, but uh, another uh, uh, to, to the past and also something that clarifies uh, the sort of um, spectacles that took place in the Hippodrome, the imperial family sitting in a box, looking down uh, on the races. Um, there are other strange um, items in the central spine of the Hippodrome too, like this serpent column um, which was taken from Delphi. Delphi, of course, in ancient Greece, was considered the navel of the world, on Palos de Sigis. Um, this particular serp serpent column, which had a kind of a bronze bowl on top of it, um, uh, and also a tripod was taken from Del Delphi as well, um, which uh, was uh, uh, considered the seat of the god Apollo, who was believed to... Um, to be the patron of Delphi, these were moved to the Hippodrome in order to demonstrate what? That Constantinople had become the new Omphalos Tisis, the new navel of the world. And so this is uh, what remains of the serpent column. Part of its head can be found in, um, in one of the, in the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. It was shot off by a uh, drunk uh, Polish um, soldier in the 17th century. Um, but the serpent column dates from the 4th century BC. It was erected in Delphi to commemorate the victory of the Greeks at the Battle of Plataea. So it's old, right? Um, tangible connections to the past. In a city like Constantinople, which probably started with a population of 100,000 people, by the time you get to Theodosius II's reign in the 450s AD, and by that stage, you have another ecumenical council. The third ecumenical council is held to emphasize the oneness of Christ's person, that he is the son of God incarnate. But we're not going to go into the theology today. Um, uh, it grew to 450,000 people. The city apparently at its height in later centuries um, had a million inhabitants. You need uh, cisterns in order to, um, let's say, uh, accumulate the water to be able to supply them with drinking water and water needed for various for various other duties, right? So 
in the city you will find if you go to uh, uh if you walk down the central spine of the city here the messi dos the main street and we've spoken about constantine's forum we've spoken about the million which um kind of uh it, that, it culminates in the Imperial Palace district. You have the Imperial Palace here, the residence of the emperors, Aya Sophia, Aya Irini, right next to the Milion. Here is the Basilica system. And you can go and visit this today if you go to Constantinople. And you can see the magnitude of this reservoir, which brought um, water uh, through the aqueduct of Valens. I don't have a photo of it here, but it's in the book, um, from further up in Thrace. Uh, and it's interesting because it's, there's a lot of uh, Corinthian and Doric columns in the Basilica system keeping up the roof. But two of these columns have heads of Medusa turned on their sides, keeping them up. And this is known as spolia, you know, using uh, artifacts and statuary from the ancient world, repurposing them um, to uh, perform a contemporary function. A lot of contemporary historians criticize the Christians for tearing apart the temples of pagan antiquity in order to kind of build their churches. And indeed, that, that's true. But guess what? The pagans were doing it also. If you look at the history of the ancient Egyptians, subsequent emperors would tear apart the temples of their predecessors to build their own temples. So it's a very, very old story. But um, interesting thing about this uh, uh, head of Medusa that you'll see there um, holding up a couple of columns to keep the roof up in the basilica cistern scholars wonder why is her head turned to the side because both of them this one has her head turned to the side the other one has its head upside down does it have to do with the fact that medusa's gaze is deadly and so they were trying to avert her gaze somehow by putting her head on its side or putting her upside down of course um uh Perseus, the ancient greek hero defeated medusa he used his shield uh, in order to see her reflection, and then he, he decapitated her. But there was this strange kind of superstition, nevertheless, in relation to Gorgons and other mythological figures in Constantinople. There's a book known as the Patria Constantinopoleos, which is a guidebook, a, a brief historical notes on various statues, churches, landmarks, and other locations in the city. And that speaks about... Um, two particular statues of Medusa in one of the public fora or forums of the city, where, because I think the author couldn't make out um, the inscriptions uh, uh, on these statues, that all future emperors had been prophesied until the final emperor, you know. So it's, uh, there's an undercurrent, even though we, we're talking about the early centuries of Byzantium now of Constantinople, of a civilization that lasted for a thousand years, that became more and more emphatically Christian, that at its height under the Emperor Justinian encompassed Greece, Asia Minor, Palestine, Syria, North Africa and Egypt, Italy, Spain, going as far west as Spain, right? So it was an enormous empire whose borders became more and more truncated as history went on. But nevertheless, the transition from pagan antiquity to this Orthodox Christian civilization uh, there remained an undercurrent of paganism and superstition and everything else. We see contemporary manifestations of that in things like Vascania and um, the evil eye and, and, all, and all that sort of thing. Um, now, at this juncture, I'll say very quickly, because we're going to get to the iconography and the mosaics and everything else uh, at some point, hopefully. I've already spoken too much about the early, early stuff. The Byzantines were able to distinguish, this Orthodox Christian civilization was able to distinguish between sacred art and architecture iconography that was venerated in uh, Orthodox worship and the veneration given to icons is transferred to the saints that they depict and so on and so forth. And it's Greco-Roman inheritance, which it respected. And um, it's basically the first museum culture that we see because in the public thoroughfares and in the streets, there are many statues of the ancient Greek gods and everything else, you know, indicating or pointing towards an organic continuity between classical civilization and Byzantine civilization. What, ha what changes in Byzantium is that, that this continuity is marked by the overarching Christian narrative. Nevertheless, they kept those statues as art for art's sake, but their priority in terms of worship was um, 
the ecclesial space with its icons and its art and architecture and everything else. So, you know, this is something that needs to be needs to be clarified. Um, and it, it's something that uh, resonates in other aspects of Byzantine culture as well. Very quickly at um, the great walls of the Emperor Theodosius, which were built in the mid fifth century in the 450s to extend the territory of the city by several kilometers in order to incorporate its growth in terms of its population and everything else. And they were re erected in response to the sack of um, the old Rome in 410 by the Goths. So it was to protect the city as well. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a segment of the walls that you can go and see if you visit um, Constantinople. They were, let's say, um, tripartite walls. There were three walls, uh, an outer wall, um, uh, which is here, the first wall, and then the second wall and an inner wall as well. And on the other side of the inner wall, there were the ramparts where soldiers would go back and forth. Here where the pavement is, there would have been a moat protecting the city. But what I'm interested to show you, there were many gates, about 17 gates across the broad expanse of um, the walls around the city. But this is the Golden Gate, which was built by the Emperor Theodosius the second in the mid 450s. And it's interesting, the Golden Gate is about here, and it initiates the main street, the Mesil Dos, which was the main, let's say, um, celebratory street where emperors would come back after a campaign and would parade down this main street, okay, the Mesil Dos. But what's interesting about the Golden Gate, and here is these. It's uh, in two parts. There's an outer gate and an inner gate. So here's the outer gate, and behind it is the inner gate. It's in the form of a Roman arch, a triple vaulted Roman arch. And Roman arches were erected um, in order to celebrate the triumph or victory of a Roman emperor over his enemies. That's the Arch of Constantine next to the Colosseum in Rome. Here you have a similar kind of uh, triple vaulted arch uh, constituting the second uh, entrance or wall of the Golden Gate. At the very top of the Golden Gate would have been statues of victory goddesses. Um, here, depersonified, it just symbolizes victory in a general sense, right? Um, there were uh, depictions of the labors of Hercules and also the um, uh, Prometheus stealing the fire, so scenes from ancient Greek mythology, which, again, the Byzantines, as Orthodox Christians, they read, but they dissociated these pagan myths from idolatry. They didn't worship the Greek gods, yeah, but they read their stories and psychologized them, along with reading the scriptures and the writings of the church fathers and everything else. But what I'm interested to show you is that in the, um, the outer wall of the Golden Gate, its initial, um, let's say, entrance, you have the Yotahi monogram, Jesus Christos, the first two letters of Jesus' name and his epithet, Jesus Christos, there's the He and there's the Yota within a wreath, so the victory of the name Jesus Christos, and two crosses on either side. You'll see these sorts of crosses on top of gates throughout the course of the Theodosian walls. And on the inner side of the inner gate, the second portal here, you will find on a piece of marble at the very top, the Hiro, the first two initials of Christos, the Christogram. This had been seen by Constantine in a vision, the, the Christogram, and he put it on the standards and shields of his soldiers. And later on, it it kind of um, made its way into the ecclesial space, the worship space as well. But what this designates is that as you pass from the space outside of the city to the space within the city, you take upon yourself the name Christ and his protection. So there's symbolism in the uh, transition from profane space or neutral space outside the city walls to the sacred space within the city that was full of many, many churches, hundreds of churches at its height. And as you pass under uh, this gate to enter the city, you pass under the name Christ, taking upon himself, upon yourself his protection. It was also considered uh, as a defense against uh, terrestrial and spiritual enemies. Interesting stuff, right? I think it's very interesting. I don't know. Um, now, 
we'll go back to columns. They're erecting a lot of columns in the ancient world because anything that's vertically above you is of significance, right? It draws the eyes upwards and you begin to contemplate what's there. The column of Marcion, uh, which was erected in the mid fifth century as well after the reign of the Emperor Theodosius II, is interesting for several reasons. When I visited this um, this particular site, that's my photo on the left, not the one on the right isn't mine. Previous photos have been mine, but uh, these photos haven't been touched up in any way. We're going to let our typesetter do that. If I start playing with them, I'll ruin them. But if you look at the um, pedestal at the very top here of the column of Marcion, and here's the base as well, on top of this column, we believe that this statue, which is now in Italy, in a place called Barletta in Italy, uh, depicted the emperor at the very top. And actually, this statue is holding a cross and a globe in his hand, as you can see there, right? Now, a few fun facts. Let's destabilize some myths about the medieval Christians. They did not believe the world was flat because here you see a Christian emperor holding the earth as a globe in his hand. So they inherited the science of, um, of uh, classical antiquity concerning the roundness of, of the earth. Okay, This is something we see in our iconography as well. This particular imagery of emperors holding globes and crosses uh, is transferred to saints like Michael, the archangel, who is often shown holding a globe in his hand, and to Christ himself. Christ is the ruler of the world. Saint Michael is the protector of the world, right? So it's imagery that influences iconography and ecclesial art. On the other hand, um, this particular emperor was important because he convoked the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which was held in Chalcedon near Constantinople in 451 AD, and which um, articulated and affirmed that our Lord Jesus Christ is one person in two natures, divine and human. In other words, he is fully God and fully man. So here's another tangible connection to an emperor who convoked an ecumenical council the doctrinal formulations of which immediately impact our experience within the church. And you can visit it. In fact, in Estonia here, a little bookshop, I found a copy of uh, Nikos Kazadzakis' uh, report to Greco with uh, uh, an inscription in Greek, a dedication in Greek. Who knows what um, uh, Roman there, you know, uh, Romios uh, inscribed this to their loved one and when. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable place to to dig up these connections with um, with the Orthodox Christians who were once in the city. At the base of um, the column, you have a depiction of two angels holding up a wreath. Um, again, a motif that's appropriated from the classical world of Christian arts. And they would have had a Cairo, the Christogram, or the Yota He uh, monogram with, within the wreath, uh, designating that it is Christ who is victorious over death, ultimately, with his resurrection on the third day. And this is a particularly tragic one, the Monastery of St. John Studios, which is the oldest extant Christian basilica. It was built in the mid-fifth century, and it was the site of the great Monastery of Studios dedicated to St. John the Forerunner, St. John the Baptist, which um, was basically the base camp for the iconophiles, the defenders of the icons who fought against emperors who in the 7th and 8th century in Byzantium were breaking the icons, the iconoclasts. It was from this monastery that St. Theodore the Studite um, began his great defense of the icons in the second wave of iconoclasm that took place in the 800s AD. It was from this monastery that St. Theodore the Studite was abbot of this monastery initiated a reform in terms of education and culture, employing scribes and copyists to create gospel books and psalters and other various texts. Um, it is from this monastery and within its sacred precincts that St. Simeon, the new theologian in the 11th century, had the vision of the transfiguring and divine light of God under the, um, the obedience that he had to his spiritual father, St. Simeon the Pious. And now it's an, it's an empty shell. It became a mosque after the fall of the city, the Imrahor Jami. And uh, there are plans to turn it back into a mosque, but it's been left for decades since a fire broke out in the 19th century, exposed to the elements. And um, that's particularly uh, 
uh, tragic in relation to St. John's Studios Monastery, the oldest Christian basilica in the world. Um, and now we arrive at the great Hagia Sophia, built by Justinian in the 6th century AD. Now, Father, do we have much more time? Yeah, okay. Hagia Sophia um, was the largest church in the world from the 6th century to the 16th century, the largest building in the world. Um, its dome uh, is about 50 meters in diameter. It's 100 meters high. Okay, so when you enter your Sophia, even when you see it from outside, it looks as though it's floating in midair. And Procopius, a contemporary historian writing at this time in the 6th century, speaks about this, the dome of Hagia Sophia seeming as though it is suspended from heaven by a golden chain. And you get this impression when you see it today as well. Um, developments in church architecture that began from the 4th century to the 6th century impact uh, church architecture and art even to this very day. Hagia Sophia is a cross in square church. In other words, when Constantine started putting money into the building of churches in the fourth century, um, uh, an architectural style developed which allowed the believer to be initiated into uh, the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the um, many churches were built in the shape of a cross. Sometimes there, there were crosses um, which were, let's say, marked by pylons or columns within the church, but they were in a square kind of design still. And this is known as the cross in square design, and the Hagia Sophia is one of these. So that when you enter the worshipping space, you enter into our Lord Jesus Christ's death on the cross to be resurrected with him as you participate in the divine liturgy. The dome of Hagia Sophia represents, like I said before, the Christians didn't think the world was flat. They, they knew it was a, a sphere, right? So the dome represents the horizon, the, the firmament, as you see, horizon from one end of a field to another, the semisphere, right? And furthermore, it represents the universe or the cosmos itself. So if you put a dome, right, as a roof over a church building, which is a cross in a square, what you are symbolizing is that through the cross, Christ saves the universe. That's very clear. And as uh, our Archbishop, uh, His Eminence Archbishop Macarius has pointed out, Hagia Sophia was the first perfect dome to be completed. Five centuries earlier, when Marcus Agrippa built the Pantheon in Rome, it's a dome structure, but there's an oculus, an eye at the center of the dome because the perfect dome would have collapsed inwards, right? The first perfect dome is Hagia Sophia. In the 14th century, the center of the underside of the dome, a great mosaic of Christ Pandocrator was placed, which is something that you see throughout Orthodox churches, uh, in Orthodox churches throughout the world, Christ Pandocrator, Christ the master of the world, the master of all, governing the cosmos. If the dome represents the universe, right, then depicting Christ at the center of the dome underlines our belief that he governs, governs the whole universe, that he's the master of the universe, the master of all. So this kind of symbolism was there in Hagia Sophia. This would have been the nave of the church, the main worshipping area, and the eastern apse here, which you can see, um, the apse there with an icon of the Panagia that I'll show you soon, that would have been the holy altar area here where the Eucharist would have been sanctified in the sanctuary by clergy. Now, of course, um, it's uh, where the uh, Midrab is located, pointing towards Mecca, and it has various other Islamic uh, pulpits and other things. But back then, it would have been the holy altar area. Um, the dome itself is upheld by these um, uh, semi semi uh, domes uh, known as conches. These are known as conches, including the apse. And these conches, they support half domes which then support the dome so it's an intricate structure there's the um the the dome itself which is half a sphere or a semi-sphere then there are two other quarter spheres holding that up and the conches which are also quarter spheres hold up those uh quarter spheres that hold up the uh, the main dome itself there is a marble pavement within a Sophia 
which is also known as the Omphalion, another navel of the world. And it was upon this spot that Byzantine emperors would be invested and acclaimed as um, emperors and kings of the Romans at the point at which uh, uh, the center of the world was uh, considered to be within the church itself. So here you have a transference from uh, the center of the world being considered, let's say, the Milion, uh, which is what Constantine had built, where you have the distances to all the cities of the empire and the cross at the top. Now the center of the world, from a symbolic point of view, is shifted into the ecclesial space, into the church space. And it was here that the uh, emperors were acclaimed as, as rulers by uh, in a ceremony. The Amna of Hagia Sophia, now its courtyard, which you can go and see um, if you visit. Uh, and there's some very interesting uh, mosaics in uh, what we call uh, timpana, or, uh, timpanum, which is like an eardrum kind. That's the name of this kind of uh, half, uh, half circle. Uh, this one is above the imperial gate, which is the main entrance from the narthex of the church into the nave of the church, and it was reserved for the emperor alone. And above the imperial gate, you have a mosaic. This one's dating from the 10th century of the Emperor Leo IV of the Wise in obeisance to Christ as Pandokrator, again, giving the blessing of peace, as you can see, with the Mother of God on one side and the Archangel Gabriel on the other. What's interesting is when this mosaic was placed above the imperial gate. It was placed above the imperial gate after the emperors uh, in two successive waves broke all the icons because they wanted to shift the attention back to themselves, what's known as iconoclasm. The church in placing this mosaic above the imperial gate is not simply reminding the emperor every time he enters the church, know your place, Christ is the boss, not you. It's a pretty remarkable um, message that's sent every time an emperor enters the church. In the so-called vestibule of the warriors, which is where the Varangian guard, the Norsemen, the Vikings, who, beginning with the reign of the Emperor Basil II, the Bulgar Slayer, were the um, elite guard of uh, the Emperor. Um, this is where they would wait in this corridor. You have this wonderful mosaic of the Mother of God holding the Christ child. And the Emperor St. Justinian dedicating a yes of Sophia to her on her right, and on her left, St. Constantine dedicating the city of Constantinople to her. This is very important because from at least the 7th century onwards, but earlier, because St. Pulcheria built many churches dedicated to the Panagia in the city in the 400s. She was the sister of the Emperor St. Theodosius II, who built the land walls of the city and the Golden Gate that we saw earlier. From the 7th century onwards, the Mother of God is considered the special protectress of Constantinople because of miracles that she performed protecting the city from invasion. And it's from the 7th century that Ti uh, Stratigo, that great hymn that we chant, um, it was written in the 7th century in order to commemorate the Mother of God's protection of the city against uh, the Avars. And um, uh, this uh, protection is here being, let's say, celebrated uh, in this icon of the founder of the city on her left, our right, and the builder of Hagia Sophia on um, her right, our left, dedicating both the city and the church to her. This dates from about the 9th or 10th centuries. In the apse of Hagia Sophia, you see this wonderful, wonderful mosaic dating from the ninth century of um, the Panagia uh, enthroned, holding the Christ child. St. Fortius the Great in the ninth century describes um, the first, let's say, unveiling of this mosaic in great detail. And um, it's currently covered by curtains because um, last year, Hagia Sophia was uh, reconverted into a mosque. But as a museum, you could have seen this um, you could have seen this mosaic pretty uh, pretty easily. Um, in the vault of the apse, you see the Archangel Gabriel depicted as well. And main dome, where those semi-domes that I mentioned earlier, those quarter domes are holding up the main dome, uh, where they connect in their encircling of the main dome, you have this kind of upside-down triangular shape formed, and that's known as a pendentive. These... 
Architectural devices distribute the weight from the dome all the way through the columns and pylons to the foundations of the structure. And this pendentive here depicts a seraph. Seraphim is the plural, um, and it's from the 14th century. There are two seraphs in, because there are four pendentives. So there's the dome and there are uh, the semi-domes around it. There are four pendentives uh, amidst those uh, semi-domes. And that's that's one of the four. Uh, the other two have later, later uh, in the um, the uh, northern side of the church in small niches are depicted saints like Saint John Chrysostom. Of course, Saint John Chrysostom um, labored in the first Hagia Sophia, which burnt down after he was exiled from the city. But the southern gallery is where you get some of the most emphatic and profound. Um, Orthodox Christian art from the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, this is the deisis mosaic. Deisis is prayer or entreaty. Um, and here you have our Lord Jesus Christ as Pandocrator, giving the blessing of peace, entreated by his holy mother and St. John the Baptist, the best examples of um, Orthodox Christian art. Ironically, tragically, opposite the deisis mosaic is the tomb of the nefarious, notorious, and I won't use expletives in this uh, in this uh, lecture, um, Doge of Venice, Henricus Dandolo, who guided the Crusaders during the Fourth Crusade in 1204 AD to Constantinople to sack the city. That's where his body was buried. They, they in fact, crippled the city uh, so that even though it recovered for several hundred years after it was reconquered by, uh, from the Crusaders by 1261 AD and um, continued until 1453 AD, so it had a few centuries in it, uh, under the Paleologians, the last dynasty to reign um, from Constantinople. And you had this flourishing of art and architecture and culture in that last period, science, everything, they were doing it all. Nevertheless, it was the Fourth Crusade that really brought down Byzantium. You had great art and architecture, statues, whatever that existed from ancient times that were preserved in the city that were destroyed and carried over to the West as loot, relics of the church, um, the crown of thorns, which was threatened by a fire that burnt down Notre Dame Cathedral a few years ago because Notre Dame Cathedral had the crown of thorns that was placed on the head of our Lord Jesus Christ. That was stolen from Constantinople by the Crusaders who took it to France. And currently the crown of thorns is in the Louvre. But in these cases, I mean, most of the relics that were taken from Byzantium, I'll show you photos in a second, are in Venice. Um, as Greeks, we harp on a lot about the Parthenon marbles, and I think it's good to do so, you know, because they were taken by Lord Elgin in the 1800s and they're in the British Museum. Half of Byzantium is in either, either Italy or France. Let's, let's uh, make some noise about getting some of those things back to the Patriarchio. Anyway, so in the Southern Gallery, you see a few other uh, important mosaics, including the Empress Zoe mosaic, dating from the 11th century. These are two emperors, uh, Cosadinos Monomachos and Zoe, his wife, in treating Christ in the center. And here you have um, the Irene mosaic with uh, her husband here. Uh, John Comnenus and Irene entreating the mother of God, holding the Christ child in the center. These scratchings here uh, look a bit uh, strange. They were made by Gandalf uh, during the, no, they were made by, um, by Vikings. These are runes, actually, Scandinavian runes. It's graffiti in the northern gallery of Hagia Sophia. Um, it, it basically says, half Dan was here. That's what it says. Um, so it's uh, a bit of graffiti uh, scratched into the church by the Vikings in the ninth century that you can you can still see. Look, I could keep going on and on. I think we've reached eight thirty. Do we want to open it up to Q and A? Do you want me to continue for about ten minutes? Whatever you'd like. I think Mario, just a few more minutes, maybe a few more slides, and then. And then we'll go to Q and A if that's okay with you. Okay, a, a few more minutes then. Well, then in that case, I won't show you the middle and later Byzantine um, art and architecture that uh, is very kind of important for the um, for our let's say tangible understanding of Constantinople because it's the middle and later Byzantine art and architecture that looks very much like our own. Uh, Orthodox art and architecture. You, you see some of that in the mosaics that I saw that I showed you anyway. 
but uh, it's churches like the Holy Monastery of the Savior in Hora and others that I address in, in, in the book and that I've got slides of here um, that would really resonate, but I won't show you that. Um, what I'll do is I'll show you a few, a few of um, the items that are in uh, Venice. So, um, Aya Irini, just very quickly, was uh, built next to Aya Sophia, and both Aya Sophia and Aya Irini, holy peace dedicated to Christ as God's very peace, um, comprise the great church complex. And today it's a museum, but if you go inside, you can see the, one of the last examples of iconoclastic art in the apse of Aya Irini. It's just a cross, a plain cross, the iconoclastic the one in the icons. In the atrium, which is an open court without a roof of Aya Irini, there's a porphyry sarcophagus. And you'll find some of them distributed through the grounds of the Istanbul Archaeological Museum. These sarcophagi were placed in the Church of the Holy Apostles, which was um, here. And uh, it was the Mausoleum Church, a cruciform church with five domes, one at the center of the, uh, of the cross and one over each arm of the cross. And adjoining it was a rotunda, a round structure where all the emperors were buried and empresses were buried. Some of them chose to be buried in later centuries in other churches, like um, in the Monastery of Constantine Lips, and also the Hora Church and Pamak Church, Nini and later Paleologia in those churches. But up until about the uh, fall of the city to the Crusaders in 1204, before they recaptured it in 1261, um, uh, most emperors and empresses were buried in holy apostles. Um, Jonathan Bardil, a contemporary historian and scholar, believes that this particular sarcophagus belongs to St. Constantine. There's no way I believe to prove that, but it belonged to someone. And you have uh, an Ankh, Egyptian Ankh with a Cairo in the upper, let's say, circular part here. Here you just have a, um, a cruciform kind of uh, uh, raw. Uh, and there's a few of these uh, sarcophagi left, but the Church of the Holy Apostles was a magnificent edifice. And if one wants to know what it looked like, paradoxically, you have to travel to Venice. And in Venice, the Piazza San Marco uh, is where you'll find St. Mark's, um, which is a 12th century church, more or less, with a Baroque facade from later centuries, um, which is modeled upon the Church of the Holy Apostles. The Church of the Holy Apostles was demolished by the conquering Sultan Mehmed II when he took Constantinople in 1453. So if you want to know what it looks like, you have to go to Venice because Venice's San Marco is a copy of Holy Apostles. And you have Orthodox and Western art within the nave of the church. Here it is from the Yenekoniti. You see the nave of the church and the altar of San Marco. But in its treasury, San Marco's treasury, you will find all these gold enameled artifacts and crosses. Relics of the saints, you see those uh, relics of arms of the saints and various other relics here. These are all stolen from Constantinople. In some cases, they're not even labeled. We don't know whose they are. These were taken by the Crusaders during the Fourth Crusade, um, as well as the horses of Lysippus, thought to be from the um, 4th century BC, more than likely from the 2nd century AD. These adorned the Hippodrome, um, the spot in the Hippodrome where the uh, charities would enter. They were just above it. But these can also be seen in the second level in the museum, which is in the second level of San Marco. Um, uh, there's more to say, but I won't say it. I looked at the Great Palace here and Hora uh, Church, which has best examples of later Byzantine frescoes. I'll end very quickly with showing you at the very least the very famous Anastasis fresco, which depicts our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ resurrecting Adam and Eve from the underworld. This is in the apse of the Paraclision, or the chapel of the Holy Monastery uh, of our Savior in Hora. Uh, these uh, frescoes have also recently been covered by uh, retractable screens because it was a museum for many decades in the 20th century, this uh, church, but now it's also become uh, a mosque. So I'll end there if you want to open up for Q&A. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. That was uh, beautiful. It uh, brought me back to my first uh, visit to Costa di Nupoli and, and, and that feeling of uh, nostalgia when... Um, I got to visit most of the places that you mentioned, and um, and it's very sad to see places like Monitis Horas and 
Hagia Sophia now becoming uh, mosques again, um, which is very sad. We will uh, open to uh, questions. Anyone that, that uh, may have a question, uh, feel free to ask. Um, Yeah, I have a question. <laughs> I'm heaven. I just put it on the chat anyway. It doesn't matter. I'll, I'll say it. I, I, um, thank you, Maria, for that lovely, uh, Dr. Maria, for that lovely presentation. It certainly gave us an insight as to what Constantinople is like. I have a question. Uh, the churches of St. Sophia or St. Irini that are based in Constantinople, do they, are they just uh, there as museums or do they conduct liturgy services, uh, regular liturgy services still? So when, when Constantinople was conquered by the Ottoman Turks in 1453, um, what happened was a systematic, let's say, closure of most of the churches in the city or the destruction or their conversion into mosques. Um, there were periods of reprieve, and in the 20th century in particular, Hagia Sophia, which had become a mosque and served as a mosque for many centuries, and Hagia Irini, um, were uh, converted into museums. Um, the same was the case for the Holy uh, uh, Monastery of Our Saviour in Hora. Um, but last year, um, Hagia Sophia and Hora were reconverted into mosques, and a lot of these frescoes and mosaics which 500 years ago when the conquest happened were covered by plaster. All this plaster was taken off. They were meticulously uh, brought back to life, let's say. Um, these have had to be covered because of the aversion to anthropomorphic imagery in uh, Islamic worship that they don't, they don't want images of people in, in, their, in, in their mosques. So this was a, a big tragedy last year in relation to Hagia Sophia and Monitis Horas. Um, there is only one church in Istanbul, um, which is uh, which dates from Byzantine times, only one, and that is the Church of Saint Mary of the Mongols, which is near the Patriarchio in the Fanar, in Fanari. Um, that is the only one that dates from the 13th century that has functioned more or less continuously from the 13th century to today as an Orthodox Christian. So that, that church conducts services, is that right? Uh, at Dixinan, his former name was Christodoulos, he was half Greek. And the Sultan at the time, Bayezid, gave his mother, his Greek Orthodox mother, St. Mary of the Mongols, as a gift. And they actually have the firmans, the official documents from the Sultan, plastered on their walls. So this uh, church has been saved because uh, they have the documents from a sultan from the 1500s who said, no, 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 this should remain a church forever. And I'm dedicating it to an Orthodox Christian lady in the city. So there's only one that has been continuously. Like I could have looked at, uh, there are other Orthodox Christian churches in the city, certainly. And St. George, the uh, patriarchal church um, at Fanari is one of them. It's the um, cathedral church of our uh, ecumenical patriarch. Um, but that dates from the 16th century, so it's out of the scope. The churches that I address in my book are from the 4th century to the, to the 15th century, to the fall of the city, from the founding of the city to the fall of the city. I don't go beyond that because um, then the, the project would have become too big. Mm, yeah. Thank you. Lavro. Hi, Mario. Um, Thank you for wonderful talk. I've got a question. I don't know if I've asked you before. There's a, um, I've seen a lot of, a lot of Byzantine churches uh, and I've got the Mabandana. So on the dome of the church, there's a cross with a moon underneath. Ah. Do you know, I know the Russians have it too. That's Rush, That's the Russian style because at Pandanasa, those crosses were gifted to Pandanasa by Father Vladimir Mikiv, who was the um, representative of the Moscow Patriarchate here for many years before he left uh -huh. about a decade ago to go back to Russia. Okay. It's the cross. Um, it's the cross uh, javelin, the uh, crescent moon, which is a symbol of Islam. So that that was a polemical kind of uh, fixture that um, dates from. Uh, 
I guess, the wars between the Ottoman Empire and Russia, because as we know, um, the Ottomans conquered all Orthodox countries after they took Constantinople. So they took Greece, they took Bulgaria, Serbia, uh, Romania. The paradox is this, and this is something that I've discussed before, but it's always good to remember. Even though those last centuries of Byzantium saw a great renaissance in terms of art and architecture, philosophy, theology, and science, and this is demonstrable. In fact, the scholars fleeing Constantinople to the West, to places like uh, Florence in Italy and other places, they ignited the Renaissance in terms of its art and architecture that flourished throughout Western Europe, right? So paradoxically, we have these great heights of spirituality and culture, but the imperial court was so obsessed, uh, and from one point of view, can't blame them, with maintaining their civilization, that they were willing to compromise orthodoxy to do so. So they kept making deals with the papacy, with the Roman Catholic Pope but in such a way that Catholicism would have been unilaterally imposed upon orthodoxy and would have ruined orthodoxy. So the church kept fighting against this. And uh, this is testified by St. Mark uh, of Yenikos or St. Mark of Ephesus, not signing the Union Council of Ferrara, Florence made a couple of decades before the fall of the city. So not wanting to sign for a union with Catholicism. And the first ecumenical patriarch after the fall of the city, Gennadios Scholarios, was very against uh, uniting with the Catholic Church for military aid. So orthodoxy is preserved in the church, but the imperial court and the empire was so insistent that many writers of the time they uh, of the time say that it's because of God's providence that the empire fell. Otherwise, orthodoxy would have disappeared. And not just for the Greeks, but for the Serbs and the Bulgarians too, because they had asked to join with the Catholics just beforehand. But under the Ottoman yoke, the Ottoman Sultan doesn't want any of the Orthodox to join up with the Catholics because that would mean military aid against the, the Ottomans. So paradoxically, the fall of the city preserved Orthodoxy. You had as the first ecumenical patriarch after the fall of the city, someone who was against union with Rome, but all of the other Orthodox nations that would have joined with Catholicism are now unable to do so because they were brought under the ecumenical patriarchate that was against union with Rome at the time. Uh, and the only nation that um, didn't fall under the Ottoman yoke, like I said, Romania fell, um, Bulgaria, Serbia, etc., uh, Georgia, the only nation was Russia. And they kept fighting back and forth with the Ottomans. That's why you have this cross cutting through the, the crescent moon. I read that, but I'd also heard that it symbolizes Bonaya. I wanted to ask, is that true? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe that's a way of softening it because it's a pretty heavy image. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mario, one question, if yeah. that's okay. Thank um, you. Just to change the topic a bit. Um, so obviously we've, we've, you know, we've heard different scholars um, talking about um, Constantine's conversion to Christianity. And um, some scholars do doubt that the, 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 uh, whether he had become a Christian or not truly a Christian. Now, without, without starting a, a new lecture, because this is a, <laughs> a <laughs> you have to warn me. topic, a discussion, um, can we see, obviously, because some of, some of these academics say that um, Constantine brought all these pagan symbols or these pagan statues to the uh, city of Constantinople. Um, are there any um, Christian features in the city that point to Constantine's gradual conversion to Christianity? Yeah, Father, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I guess the problem is when scholars isolate his founding of the, of the city of Constantinople from the rest of his career and legacy because he founds the city, he begins construction in 325, construction ends in 330, he's already 50, 60 years old at this stage, and in 337 he dies. So his powers wane, he becomes weaker and so on and so forth. The final war that he had planned to fight against the Persians never takes place. He begins with a lot of Christian activity in and around Rome right after his conversion. So what we see with Constantine, obviously he was a figure that had to placate both the pagans and the Christians in his empire. He had favored the Christians, of course. And after his conversion to Christianity in 312 AD, he legislates on behalf of Christians. He makes, um, he bans certain forms of um, 
uh, of punishment and capital punishment uh, in line with Christian teaching. Um, he supports Orthodox Christianity as opposed to the heretical groups that were around at the time. And he rings Rome in churches all at the expense of the imperial treasury. So he builds the churches of St. Agnes, St. Sebastian, St. Lawrence, St. Paul outside the walls, St. Peter, St. Peter on the Vatican Hill. All of these are built by Constantine. And he also builds the churches in the Holy Land. Um, by the time you get to Constantinople, he begins a project there, but he only manages to complete two, two churches before, before he dies. So to isolate his activity in Constantinople, Constantinople and say, look, he only built two churches is problematic because he, one is not considering his entire career where he built so many and legislated on behalf of Christians and so on and so forth. Ultimately, I think scholars are impeded um, by their reluctance to consider texts from the past which um, consider God's uh, providence in the unfolding of events. So, you know, they, they look back at Constantine and they say, well, he's a politician. He must have been shrewd and calculating. No doubt he was, but he was also, he's also a saint of the church. Why is he remembered as a saint of the church? Um, it's not only because of his external contributions to world Christianity. The very first basilica churches were built by Constantine. If it wasn't for him, a church like St. Catherine's in its rectangular shape would not have existed. He was the first to build churches like that. You know, so providence is certainly at work in his external activity. But who can judge the conscience of the man? He might have been fighting within himself, you know, the role that he had as emperor, fighting wars and putting people to death and whatever emperor and also repenting at night, building his churches, doing whatever else. And towards the end of his life, like the thief on the cross, he said, God, forgive me. And the thief was given entrance to paradise. Why wouldn't Constantine be given entrance to paradise? So, I mean, I think we have to trust, trust the church's memory in relation to the saints. The church remembers those who, through the grace of the Holy Spirit, have been raised as saints in the church. And the scholars will often get it wrong. And this is just one big example of how they've gotten it wrong in relation to Constantine. Thank you. One last question and we'll finish for, for the night. So, Evan. Evan. Thank you. Uh, um, Christos, um, one question I have. You mentioned that there were uh, roughly uh, 17 gates at Theodosian Wall, the second wall that was built to expand Con Constantine. And you mentioned that one of the gates was called the Golden Gate, and you showed us a, a, a photo of the Golden Gate. Mm -hmm. Is that the main entrance to Constantinople? That was the main entrance reserved for the imperial retinue, so for the emperor and his family and his bodyguards and, and all of that. It wasn't for you and I couldn't get in through that entrance. Okay. So, <laughs> So you and I would go through a different entrance? There were or, other gates. And other the gates gate. were usually named after, after where the roads that jutted out from the gate, those gates, where those roads culminated in which cities. So Porta to um, Adrianopoli, something like that, you know, like it, the, the gates were named after the cities that their roads would lead to or after a major feature that would condition those gates, like Porta Turusiu, which was the name of one of the gates, was named after the Red Faction, because the Red Faction, which was a circus faction that helped to maintain the Hippodrome and also competed in the um, events in the Hippodrome, um, the Red Faction was um, maintaining that gate. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, an observation I've got from Emmanuel about the publication. Yeah, so when, when the book comes out, Remnants of New Rome, so I, I don't mean to market my work like this, but the presentation is based on my work. So, you know, if, if you're interested in the book, you can get it. And of course, I'll, I'll advertise it on the St. Andrew's Orthodox Press Facebook page, on the Archdiocese Facebook page. God willing, it, it will be advertised, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of Australia, our St. Andrew's Orthodox Press Instagram page, and also my Facebook pages. And all of our books can be purchased at the Greek Orthodox Book Centre's uh, website so god willing by the end of the year if not next year thank you maria thank you very much for a beautiful presentation obviously we've um we've spoken many times about these um about your byzantine travelogue and uh have traveled with you um um you know uh, when i was uh traveling to costa di um it was through your advice and 
uh, the places to that I would should visit. That uh, I I enjoyed the the Eternal City, um, and uh, I do hope that one day we're able to visit Costa di Nupoli again. Uh, so thank you once oh, again, me. and uh, very much oh, looking forward to your your newest uh, addition to the academic world, your book. Uh, we're very much looking forward to it and uh, and reading it. So I uh, will finish off with prayer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Bless you. The Efron ton Agion Pateron Imon, Kirie Isu Christeo Theos, Eleison Kesoson Imas Amin. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you. Thank you for having me.